In this video we will present an insight about Ghanaian robotics engineer, Dr. Ashidi Tribialenu, who works at NASA. He was recently awarded the Society's Silver Medal for his major contribution to the successful development and delivery of the InSight Mars Mission Instrument Deployment System. This enabled the first robotic deployment by NASA of a seismometer on another planet. Born in Accra, Ghana, Dr. Tribialenu went on to have his tertiary education in the UK and later joined NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1999 and rose through the ranks to become the leader of the team that designed the Mars rover robot that landed on the Red Planet. Dr. Tribialenu shares in this video insight about his work at NASA and the space industry. It's always exciting that you're going to work on a mission that is going to make the footnote of history. I'm Ashti Trebulenu, and I work on robotic arms for planetary exploration. This is a mock-up of the InSight lander. It's a one-to-one -one scale of the actual spacecraft. InSight is going to Mars and it's going to probe deep beneath Mars to be able to observe the fingerprints of how Mars came to be. On InSight, we have a robotic arm. You can see the upper arm, the forearm, and our responsibility is to pick up the instruments that the scientists are going to use to examine the planet hundreds of millions of miles away, blindfolded, and you want to precision place it on the surface where the scientists want you to put it. It's kind of fun. When I was a kid in Ghana, I lived very close to the airport, so I was very interested in aircrafts flying and always dreamt of taking humans out of the cockpit and just making computers fly. And I think I'm doing the same thing here. We're making things autonomous. To see it from paper to actualization is just so much fun. <laughs> Inside project is unlike any other Mars mission. Okay, so so far when we go to Mars, we do what we call we try to do surface history. We go around, drive around, look at the rocks, look at the soil, look at the basic the history. We, we look at what is right right in front of us, and I call that kind of investigation. It's like you go to a crime scene, right? And you see broken bottles, you see blood everywhere. You just kind of inspect a moss, and then you're trying to recreate go back in time. Okay, see, so this is what it is now. What is it? What was it before? Inside is very different. Inside, we're delving deeper into the surface of Mars, okay? And we're literally giving Mars medical checkup, okay? So what do you do for a medical checkup? When we go to the doctor, the doctor takes our what? vital signs. What are our vital signs? He takes what? Do we have a pulse? We're going to take the pulse of Mars. That's Mars part of the pulse. And how do we answer that? We use seismology. So we're, we're going to put a, seismo, uh, a seismometer on the ground, which is built by Canis, Canis uh, and an Imperial College in Oxford. So actually, there's a UK component to this. Where the seismometer has two components, it's got what we call a very broad band seismometer that is built by the French, Canis. And then the short period is built by Imperial, and the electronics is built by Oxford. So that's how we're going to measure to see whether uh, it's got a, a pulse. The second thing that you do when you go to a, a physician for a medical checkup, they, don't, they take your what? Temperature. We're going to take the temperature of Mars. So what we have is a heat probe, or a self-hammering nail. It's going to hail itself to up to about five meters in the ground. It's built by the Germans, the German space agents, the DLR. And it's going to hammer itself all the way five meters, up to five meters to the ground. And it's going to have a tether, a trailing tether with a lot of um, Thermocouples, basically. A thermocouple is something that measures temperature. So once it gets to its destination, it's going to stop and it's going to take the temperature of Mars for a year. Okay. Then we go to a doctor. What do they check? They check our reflexes. They take this funny hammer and they hit you on the wrist or something to see how you reflex. So we're going to do that as well, where we use the RISE uh, instrument to be able to figure out how Mars reflexes, how Mars wobbles around its axis and be able to know the shape of Mars. So inside is answering one of the most fundamental questions in the solar system, right? Or planetary geology. How do the rocky, the inner planets, the rocky planets, how do they get formed? What processes kind of create these rocky planets? So inside is looking for what I'll say, the fingerprints of the processes of how rocky planets with are formed. My dream as a boy was basically at the era of what we call the glass cockpit, where we were having you know autopilots trying to take humans from the from the cockpit basically, and that's what fascinated me as a boy. So I was really interested in building 
making planes fly themselves. So I came to England and I went to Queenberry College. I did avionics and I did my PhD at Cranfield Royal Military College of Science. And all I was interested in designing autopilots, making things autonomous. So I, I, I wasn't planning to, it was my great plan to go to NASA and get robots to be autonomous. It just happens. But I'm doing what I really enjoy doing, autonomy, basically. So I, I don't really care whether it's applied to robots, it's applied to vehicles or anything. So long as it's autonomous, I'm just something that interests me greatly. So most, most folks are always fascinated about uh, driving on Mars and they say, do you joystick your robot on Mars? The answer to that is no. It's you know, at the closest point it takes five minutes to send a signal from here to the rover, right? By the time it gets to the rover and finishes driving, it sends it back. You, may, you might have driven it to a rock or something. What we actually do is we do what parents do with their kids. If you're a teenager, when I was a teenager, I remember my mom, we wake up and my mom has a list of chores that I have to do, right? You gotta wake up, you gotta eat at this time, you gotta take your siesta, which we never did. You gotta have your snack and your tea. So. That's what we do to the rover. We tell the rover on a daily basis, we give it a list of things. We program it and say, wake up at eight o'clock. When you wake up, take a picture of this rock, drive there, do this, and at 1 p.m., there'll be a satellite coming overhead. Get all, gather all your data and ship it to the satellite. And that's how we drive the rover. So we give it a list of chores. The rover is semi-autonomous. It's like a very good teenager. We design the rovers to be autonomous. But when we talk about autonomy, we talk about safety, right? So we'd, we've designed and tested the robot in such a way that we know the robot is not gonna kill itself. If I ask the robot to drive over a cliff, I can assure you the rover will not drive over the cliff because we have got safeguards. So there are safety measures that we put in it. We, yeah, are there sequencing errors? Yes, there are sequencing errors that can lead to, but we do try to catch those on the ground and we do set up the robot that it doesn't do anything silly. People are always fascinated by space research and I think the fundamental question they tend to ask is, you know, like Curiosity costs $2.5 billion. And they say, look at the suffering in the world why do you spend $2.5 billion in space exploration while you can save? And it's a very emotional question, but the fact, the fact is that we don't take $2.5 million, pack it in the suitcase, and put it in the rocket, and shoot it up to Mars. We do use it, we do use the money right here on Earth, develop technologies that are very important. And I think for the Wacom Trust, for example, if you look at Ebola, most people don't know that space Technology is at the forefront of Ebola, the fight against Ebola. If you look at the ideology that has been done, just the spread of the virus, how do you think they get that data? How do you think who has been able to model the spread of the disease to be able to stop it, to be able to predict where it's going to go and build from? space technology? People are making phone calls. They have cell phones. It's telling them where the disease is happening in real time. It's a space technology, you know? In the most remotest part of the world, you go there, there's no drinking water, there's no, but they have a cell phone. How do you think that happens, space technology? You know, we have immunization in very remote places where there's no refrigeration. How do we get the medicines there? We have phase change materials that were developed through the space program. So I can keep going on and on that. And I think in most of my interviews in the developing world, I, all, I always say this that the developing world benefits disproportionately with respect to the investment that they make in space, which is zero. You know, even to win the lottery, you just have to buy a ticket. But here, they don't even buy a ticket and they're winners. So it, it benefits my kind. And I think that's the message you want to send, that it's not, money is not being spent for the frivolously. It's being spent to make life better on Earth. If you enjoyed this video and want more updates about informative and trending news in Africa, make sure to subscribe to join the new Africa family. Thanks for watching, and contact us if there is any exciting stories you want us to cover.